Welcome skeptics and truth seekers to Schoolhouse Croc, the podcast that fearlessly exposes the real deal behind public education in the state of Colorado. I am your host, Stacey Castile, and on this show, we are not here to sugarcoat. We are here to unveil the truths, challenge the norms, and unpack the croc of you-know-what that often goes unnoticed in the realm of education. Today, I have with me guest Corey Hale. Corey, can you introduce yourself? My name is Corey Hale. I am a fifth grade teacher in a rural public school here in Weld County, and I have taught for nine years in the classroom in upper elementary in fourth or fifth grade. I am a second generation teacher where my mom had, had taught for over 27 years in the classroom and I currently attend church here in Greeley, Colorado, and am the the children's church director for my church. So I have lots of interest in public education and teaching in public schools. So watching these things that are coming down the pike is really something very, very important to me. So definitely when you mentioned coming down, you mean from the state legislation standpoint of it all? Yes. Is there any particular bills that are currently being heard that are concerning to you? Well, there's one that talks about non-legal name changes, and pretty much it tells us as a public educator that if a student wants to be called by a different name, prefers a different name, that essentially I as a teacher have to apply, have to abide by what that student wants, regardless of what the parent says, regardless of what it, it, it is in reality that that student regardless of, of what the reality is. And, uh, you know, to me, that's a very slippery slope that we are going down because of the fa- fact that, for one, it it pretty much removes a parent from our schools. It removes a parent from any decision that we're making. And it goes against my faith in believing that parents are the one. You know, the Bible tells us to train up a child in the way that we should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Well, that's a parent's mandate. So I should be involving the parent in that decision of whether the child wants to be changed, change their name. And I think we've had in the state of Colorado with sex changes as well. It goes against every norm that there ever is. Well, and if you look at it in the aspect, too, of, okay, let's talk about a fire drill. Let's talk about a tornado drill. Let's talk about a field trip. What if all of the teachers that are there are not aware of this name change, right? Because you're hiding it from the parents. And so if you're hiding it from the parents, you're probably not completely broadcasting it across the board to staff. A kindergarten teacher would not need to know what a fifth grade student is doing, right? But what if they are the ones in charge and they're looking for little Johnny, but Johnny wants to be Sally. Is that not a risk for that child? Active shooter situations. Yes, it is an absolute risk and an absolute, uh, absolute travesty that you're going to put those children at risk and uh, in those type of situations. But, you know, this is what we're getting out of some of the, I'm just going to state it, it's the liberal, a liberal legislature that we have here in Colorado. It, it's absolutely repulsive. And our children are pretty much running the show. Yes. I mean, are. it's not, the parents aren't in charge of the child's education. I, as a teacher, aren't in charge. The local school board's not in charge. It's now the it, it's now the child that's in charge, and we pretty much have to go with what what they say. I mean, little Johnny in fifth grade can't even walk across the street by himself, but we're saying that they can change, they can have a different name. They want to be called a different name. We have to go by that. They want to change their sex. They have to go by that. That's absolutely insane. It is. And just for everybody's record, the bill that Corey is discussing right now is HB 24-1039. I think that it, like you said, it is absolute insanity. We cannot legally leave these children alone overnight. There are guidelines in which how long you can leave a child, what hours can a child be left alone so if we can't trust them to be left alone, to, to care for themselves, how are we trusting them to make these types of changes? Yeah, it, we, we can't trust them. I mean, 
So all the all of these things that are coming, I mean, I think there were three bills here in the last week or so, or within the last month or so, that that really it's it's almost taken the parents' hands out of it. One hundred percent. And there's actually um, one of the state representatives, Stephanie Vigil. She is out of El Paso County. She has specifically said the parents cannot be trusted. As a teacher, do you feel that way? Or do you feel do you feel like you are smarter, more educated, more capable of making a decision for a child than what a parent is? No. I mean, the parent lives with that child. The parent is, is at home with that child. You know, so to tell me that the parents can't be, be trusted, maybe she can't be trusted Amen. with Amen. legislation, and I'm going to say that. So she needs to step away from the legislature, actually put in put sane people in that actually can be trusted with legislation and know what's best for the kids. When I'm the teacher, I'm the adult in the room. When the parent goes home, there are the adults there. And and I expect that out of the parents. Now, you've got those kids that probably, you know, would get get physically abused or something like that. I get that. But that's not the majority of parents. Well, and wouldn't you say that in situations where a student is not being abused at home, okay, but there's an issue in your classroom, you're going to reach out to the parents so that you guys can wrap around that student and try to help them yes. succeed in school. Now, if you see a student in your classroom that you have concerns that they're being abused, then at that point you would say, hey, yeah. I don't feel like this is a safe situation. Let me get somebody else involved because I cannot go to the parents. The, the chances of of a student being abused at home, whether mentally, physically, emotionally, verbally, whatever, is so much smaller than what is really happening. Mm -hmm. But yet we want to make these mass changes that will affect all students across the board, whether they're being abused or not. You know, and in my tenure as a teacher, my nine years as, as a teacher in public education, if we feel like a child is being abused... We have a number that we can call and we can, we're supposed to contact. So if you're clergy, if you're, if you're a coach, if you're, I mean, even if you're a volunteer in the school, we have the ability to, to contact somebody and, and say, hey, this child is in danger. We feel like this child need, we need somebody to check on it. Now, at, sometimes they come back and say, yeah, everything's okay. You know what, but, but, and we can have our anonymity as a teacher, our, we can, we can stay private as a teacher. So if we're concerned about that, you know, okay, we, 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 we have ways to get around that. I mean, but this, this whole not involving the parents and the sex change or wanting to be called they, them, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. If you call somebody they, them, or if a child wants to be called they, them, that is absolutely, I, I would ask the kid whether they have multiple personalities. Yeah. Well, and I think if you even look at it from an educational standpoint, how do you properly teach a child grammar? No, you if can't. you can say, well, wait a minute, that's a multiple, but you're only a single, but like we'll play along and let you think that you're a multiple, even though you're only a single. <laughs> or, or, or a kid that believes that they're a furry. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can't even, if a kid wants to be a furry, I mean, there's, I've heard of uh, public school districts who have put a, a cat litter box in the bathroom. Why are we even doing that? Yeah. If you want to be an animal, you stay at home. My cat stays at home. He has his litter box at home. He doesn't need a litter box in my classroom, and I don't bring him to the class. This isn't Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> sorry, Bart. You, sorry, Bart. You're not coming to my classroom. I, you're a great cat, but you're not coming to my classroom. That's, by the way, that's my cat's name is Bart. So, <laughs> Is there any other legislation that's coming down that's... That's also concerning to you. Oh, well, let's see. Here's SB 24-034. It talks about increasing access to school-based health. Looking at this bill summary, it talks about increasing access for primary health care, behavioral health care, oral health care. You know, one of the things that I found out is actually this is not even just limited to students. Teachers <laughs> can now access this as well. Yeah. Um, they get grants from the federal government. Um, but when they were actually discussing this a couple of weeks ago during session, they had a doctor from the Denver area 
go on and testify in, in favor of this, of yeah. course. And she was talking about what an amazing situation she'd encountered that day where a student was making some risky sexual decisions and had confided in a teacher and the teacher was able to get her in touch with the doctor and they were able to do a physical exam, a little bit of an emotional exam and then kind of go this this mm-hmm. route. And they were able to do that all without talking to the parents. Now, this is a gray area because Representative Lundin had asked for clarification if the parents had been notified, and they said, well, in this situation, the student was 18. But unless it's sexual assault, if a student is 12 years old or older, Mm -hmm. they can actually make a decision to not have their parents involved. And that's that's terrifying as well. And so what you're running into this, and, and I get you know, you want to make sure that you have healthy students and things like that, which is why I I think dentists, for as, for as long as I can remember, there are times that they provided low-cost health care. I remember when I was teaching over on the Western Slope, I uh, the college that they had right in that town had the, did a day where kids would go and get their teeth cleaned. And so you've had that where dentists provide some some dentists come in and provide low cost health care. I think uh, Weld County has even had a day where where they've had people come in and uh, at Island Grove and and do their their dentist. Uh, they have oral health care, you know, behavioral health care. Again, it's you know we have that already. So in place where kids can get that low cost health care, they don't need a health care clinic on in a school. What school needs a full-blown health care clinic unless you're going around the parent and trying to stop the, the, the parent from hearing about well, it? It's, they, it's absolutely insane. They target the parents yeah. of single parent homes, the full-time working, unable to take time off parent households, because those are the ones that they can say, well, see, look at how much easier we make this for yeah. you. But that parent may be thinking that their kid's going to get a free d- dental exam, whereas then they're also talking to them about their mental health and yeah. prescribing them medications, sexual health. All of these different aspects can be then slowly crept in through the back door. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah, it, again, it, it's, it's taken away the parents. And this is something, I mean... We have health care clinics that we can go to that provide low-cost health care. If you tell them what their situation, oftentimes, you know, and you go to an emergency room, they cannot deny you based off of your funding. Yeah. I mean, it's... We have signs it, all over. Yeah. If you go into a hospital, you cannot be denied services because of your, because of your income. Yeah. Again, this is all about trying to subvert the parents, all about trying to subvert the the teacher, all about trying to subvert the adults that should be the adults. Yes. Well, and like you would stated, you know, the kids are running the show. That's 100% correct. So we are trying to cut the parents out. We're trying to empower children to think that they have the ability. I mean, you know, you hear stories about kids who, you know, call the police on their parents for disciplining them or something. First of all, as a child, any time that I got disciplined, I I earned that discipline, mm-hmm. okay? I could not imagine what would have been my next discipline if I would have called the police on my parents. Well, but what we have yeah. is a generation of kids who are entitled, entitled yeah. They're who enti- think that they can. Yeah. Um, I was at my daughter's school, uh, oh gosh, it was probably in September, October. It's a high school, so they're driving. I see a kid pull out like an idiot. And I'm like, oh, kids. And then, you know, I'm busy multitasking. And all of a sudden, I hear wheels squealing. And I was like, what is that? And I look up, and I see that same vehicle jumping across a median sidewalk of the school, almost hits another car who has to slam on their brakes to stop Mm -hmm. so he can go. And he goes and he does this a couple more times. So I'm like, okay, here comes, here comes the Karen and me. No problem. So I get out of where I was parked waiting for my child. I go and I take a picture of their license plate because I want to notify the principal. Is there damage? Is this a repeat offender? Is this, this person, it wasn't immediately after school, but there was still a lot of cars and a lot of students on campus. It was a risk for them. 
So the kid caught me because I'm not stealthy at all in doing this. And he confronted me. Why are you taking a picture of my car? Uh, why are you driving like an idiot? Because what you're doing is illegal. Yes. It's, it's wrong. And then he goes, I'm just a kid. You need to let me have fun. You probably didn't have any fun as a kid. And I just kind of laughed because, you know, of course, <laughs> the flood of all of the yeah. things. Yeah. But if yeah. I would have got caught doing those things when I was yeah. a kid by an adult, I would be like, please don't tell my mom. Yeah. Oh, crap. I'll never do it again. So, like, so, so I had a teacher, uh, ag teacher in, uh, in high school and. You know, he talked to my dad and and, uh, and things like that. And my dad, my dad was was pretty harsh. And in fact, we you talked about earlier about you know, um, my dad would have said, "Here's the phone. You can call call social services yourself. You can call social services up fine." <laughs> Just remember that that right end at the, at the end of my at my property. Yeah. Um, which you know that that's another whole whole animal itself nowadays. But uh, but. Uh, and God bless my dad. He's he's went on to be with uh, the Lord and things like that. So, um, but uh, one of the the things the ag teachers looked at me and said, "My dad gave you permission to beat your." And I'm not going to say it on the show, but you can <laughs> you can guess what the other <laughs> word was. And, and that's what my dad would have. My dad said it was, and I sh- immediately shut up at that moment because I knew that that's what my dad said. And this teacher. Would have honored his request, yeah. and and all of our teachers probably would have honored their request. Now, where we as teachers are afraid that to even do anything, we had somebody in a, a we had a one of our paras at the school I'm teaching at. The kid started running, and 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 they went after and and grabbed the kid to try to get him back. And the kid literally yelling at this para at to the office. Uh, I mean. And just screaming and yelling. I mean, I would have never, I would have probably looked at that kid and said, you ever yell at me like that again, you let me tell you, you're going to get far worse. And talks to one, uh, talks to our principal and the, doesn't lose recess, doesn't lose anything. We're not supposed to, and this is the problem. There's no, there's no discipline in our class. No. We, we can't discipline because, well, let me tell you, if you discipline, you're, you're hurting the psychology and the ego of that kid because their feelings go over the other kids. Yeah. I mean, so, so. Well, we put this, we also put this, you know, like we talked about making these changes for, you know, kind of like umbrella changes for everybody when it's really a small percentage. I mean, that's exactly what it is with behavioral mm-hmm. issues is we don't care if we hurt the rest of the classroom. As long as that child who is acting out feels okay, then that's all we got to do right now. Yeah. The same thing with this, with the name changes. I mean, how confusing for these kids to be like, well, my friend Johnny now wants to be called Sally, and I don't know how this makes me feel. And, you know, like, it's kind of weird. Um, down in the Cherry Creek School District back in, I believe, November or December, um, there was an overnight field trip, and an 11-year-old boy who identifies as a girl was not only roomed in a room, but in a bed with an 11-year-old girl. What about her feelings? How did... No, what about no, that? Nobody asks her feelings. As no. long as that no. little boy who thinks he's a girl feels okay, feels included, that's all that matters. Yeah, nobody asks for their feelings, I mean, or things like that, and, and it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you're not asking for the other kids' feelings. No, we are expecting inclusion at the sacrifice of, of, of 99% of our students. Yeah. And, and yeah, my job is to teach 20 students, but yet I'm supposed to take that child that that's uh, that's causing disruptive, having behavioral problems, and let them allow allow them to be in the classroom. That's that's absolutely insane. It's it's absolutely wrong. So yes, yes, yeah. I think that we should also discuss the content of material in the libraries. And I know um, just, you know, you and I have had conversations, Mm -hmm. uh, multiple, about the content of the books and and the school libraries, what kind of ramifications that has. You know, I mean, I've got to say, I've read some of those books and some of the content in those books is absolutely horrible. Um, We had a school... Even as an adult, right? Even as an adult. I mean, one of the things it talks about is, is bestiality. And and I'm gonna get a little graphic here, so sorry for your listeners. Sex with a cow, 
I mean, we live in Weld County. I believe JBS Swift is one of the largest processing plants for cattle in the nation. And for District 6 to allow for a book that talks about bestiality in the classroom. Just for the record, I'm pretty sure if a JBS Swift employee was caught engaging in bestiality with one of those cows, would they ho- would probably be fired. I'd hope they'd be fired. And the District 6 to, to accept a book like that into their classroom. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things, you know, um, when we were challenging some of the content of the books in the library and, and just saying like, you know, the biggest thing that we think is, is that the parents should be notified prior to, mm-hmm. to, to say, Hey, your student has shown interest in checking out this book. We want to talk with you. We want you to be prepared, right? Like what we talked about a little while ago, if a student in your classroom is having a problem, you're going to include the parents so you mm-hmm. guys can work together. So why wouldn't the schools include the parents yeah. to talk with them about there is some heavy content. There's stuff that, you know, adults I mean, talks don't about understand. R- rape, bestiality, things like that. Those are not, I mean, it's not like when when schools were showing Schindler's List. Schindler's List was a was an historical movie based off of real life events. And your parents had to sign and your, before. Yes, your you parents to had it. to sign before. These are not historical events. And if a kid needs to connect to that book because they went through that, again, they need to go to a psychologist. They don't need to be reading it in a class, in a library or in a classroom library. It's absolutely... And they want to give some of these books to my fifth graders? No way will that ever happen in my classroom. Yeah. It will never happen. And, and some of this stuff that District 6 has pulled, not pulling some of these books... Deidre needs to be ashamed of herself. She needs to absolutely stop thinking because she gets a big paycheck from District 6, and she needs to challenge some of this stuff. And and quite frankly, the porno pastor... Michael Matthews. Michael Matthews needs to actually be a pastor and stand up for the truth and be... Oh, but these books have literary value, don't you know? Well, you, they're not they're not actually considered obscene the, according then, to their definition. Then the definitions. parent can go buy it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon. They can, Amazon, yep. they can go to go to wherever they want. They do not need to be in the classroom. require the parent to be involved and if their whole yeah. agenda is to get the parent out, out of, of the, the classroom, class. yeah. then that's fine. You know, I think it's interesting too when we talk about some of the the book content and such, you know, there's really no oversight to it. A teacher can actually just reach out to the American Library Association and say, I want this book in my school district, in my library. And then the next time that that library gets a shipment of books because they Mm -hmm. just, it's, you know, a crapshoot. Here you go. These are the books that you're going to get this this year, this month, whatever their frequency is. And then there they are. So once they came in and the parents started to realize what was going on, then the school districts all panicked. Again, they're more focused on keeping the content in instead of finding a cohesive system for it. Like I said, notifying the parents beforehand. If you think that your student is capable of reading this Mm -hmm. book and you want them to be able to check it out from the library and they're, you know, it's age appropriate, they're high schoolers, whatever, then they can do that. But it's, it's something that the parents are aware of, they're on board with, they're prepared to have hard conversations with their students i'm a bookworm myself Mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite things to do is read and so i read one of the books and i read it in a day because the book the writing was geared for second through fifth grade Mm -hmm. but the content was geared for ninth through twelfth grade so is it that our ninth through twelfth graders are only reading at a second through fifth grade level or are we trying to introduce ninth through twelfth grade concepts to second through fifth graders? I should not have been able to read this book in a day. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's be honest. For most of our kids, if you look at statistics, our kid, our even ninth through twelfth graders are reading at a between a second and a fifth grade level. Yeah. I think I think it's a, so. It's so, basically a combination of both. It's a combination our, of both. Our older kids can't mm-hmm. read, and they want to introduce these yeah. disgusting conversations with younger kids. Something I touched on a couple of weeks ago was 
our superintendent in District 6 handpicked people that she knew would not ever stand up to her. So these are all her yes men. Yeah, so, so you, I mean, you're letting one person decide who's going to be on this committee. A library resource may not be removed by request for reconsideration is pending. A principal, librarian, media specialist, an other employee, contractor, or volunteer may refuse a directive to remove a library resource if such an individual has a good faith belief. Well, how about removing it while it's being looked into? Yeah. So we're not going to cause controversy and then say, well, you know what, we've removed it. We're going to hold it off until then. That's what we would do almost in every other case. Yep. You're essentially saying that we ha- we can't remove something that could be potentially dangerous, not only psychologically to our kids, but uh, sexually to our kids and things like that, because they're going to get ideas from this book. Again, it's not like Schindler's List. Correct. I mean, some of these books are not like Schindler's List, and to equate it with Schindler's List you know, the movie or things like that is absolutely horrible. Yeah. So what about if a school board gets to appoint these people and you interview people to be on these boards yeah. instead of just saying, okay, just willy nilly. Or even if like each school board member, so say, you know, for instance, ours is a seven member board. Yep. If each of them brought one person, person and to, recommended. The, to yep. the table exactly. to, to be on the board, yes, there's probably still going to be evenness or the... Yep of views, right? Because that's typically how our school board votes is a a 5-2 split. So it's going to probably be like that, but it would still give somebody a voice because it sounds like these books are being approved across the board by everybody that nobody sees a problem. You know, and I have no problem with the librarian being on the board or the media specialist because they're, that's kind of what they're in charge of. Okay. But then allowing other people to have that responsibility as well yeah. i mean you know it's funny they yeah. talked about um one of the books that we challenged they weren't going to review it because it had been removed from the library due to inactivity okay but then one of the other books that was reviewed and, and it went yeah. to appeals and they had the big um show at the school board meetings one of the board members brenda campo spitz said that she's like i don't know what the big deal is Anyways, it's not like anybody's even checking this book out. It hasn't been checked out since 2016. So then why are we keeping it? So we went through that whole process and we kept that book because that's what made people feel warm and fuzzy inside. But then we took out another book because it wasn't being utilized. This doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm going to tell you that we had a school board member who actually went to the shelf, found one of one, a book that they found reprehensible and, and, Pulled it off of their shelf, pulled it off of our library shelf. I, I, I praise God for that because that's the right thing to do. Yes. I mean, and, and it's not that we're saying that these books can't be in a parent's home. So it, it's not like it's not still accessible if the parent wants them to have it. They can still have it accessible. If you can't read a book at a school, at a school board meeting, you can't read a book, then your your 12th grader can't read it. Your 11th grader shouldn't be able to read it. I'm sorry, Pastor Matthews, Pastor Porno. You cannot read. If you can't have that read at your school board meeting, you can't have it read in all your, your libraries. Don't put it in your library. Yeah. It, well, either, if if push... you can't have that read in, in the school board meeting, don't you ever have it in your library. You are a reprehensible person for doing that, if that's the case. I think one of the other things that's also concerning is, and, and you know, truthfully, um, with challenging the books, the content of the books in the Greeley Evans District 6 District doesn't even actually start to approach this problem, but it's the High Plains Public Libraries. Um, I know that the the bookmobile goes out to your area yep. and, and it goes out to multiple areas throughout the county. Um, and they are bringing these books there and then it's There's opening the door for children to have access to them. Yeah, I think it was last year I caught one of my students. Um, they had a book that was promoted by GLAAD. So G-L-A-A-D. And GLAAD is the pretty much Bands gays and lesbians... And, yeah. And so here, so again, it's gays and it's promoting a certain lifestyle to these kids. I mean, you know, it's, it's something that we need to definitely worry about. 
you know, so, so we think some of this stuff that, oh, well, it's just happening in District 6, well, it's going to trickle out there. I had a school board member says, well, I don't want to f- force my religion on people. Well, these laws that they're passing, the, the, some of this stuff is coming out, out to our district, and it's coming out here real soon. It, and we think, oh, well, it's just we're a small rural school district, and, we, you know, we can fight this. We have conservatives on the school board. Yes and no. Because we as conservatives sometimes are the ones that go, well... We don't want to rock the boat. Yeah, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to say anything. Well, it's time to speak up. Yeah. It's time to say enough is enough. I mean, we have kids that actually live in District 6, but their parents work out for us, so they come out to our school. So some of the... there And there's some some that move out there because they're tired of this, this stuff. We've had parents that moved out there because they were getting tired of it well and they even took their special needs child Mm -hmm. out of a district that has more resources more capabilities to handle that child than the district that they Mm -hmm. ended up putting that child into specifically because they were sick and tired of the stuff that the Greeley Evans District 6 was pushing as a teacher I know that you're not a parent but as a teacher, can you fault the parents for no, that? No, I cannot fault the parent, especially if you're going to have your child have books that pretty much have pornography in it. Yeah. I cannot fault it. I think that one of the other things that's probably a little concerning, too, going back to the movement of the students from bigger school districts to smaller school mm-hmm. districts, more rural, um, I've heard stories of parents who would commute one way 45 minutes just to yep. take their kid to a different school and then back. Mm-hmm. What is that doing in terms of class size and staffing for smaller districts? Is this a major issue for you guys? So I, I got to say that we have 20 kids, just my class. Yeah. Any other, is there only one fifth grade class at your There's school? There's only one fifth grade class at my school. So, I mean, we are packed in there. Yeah. I mean, we are we were tight. It's a tight classroom. I mean, I have virtually no other place to put a, put more <laughs> desk or hardly anything like that. I'm virtually packed in there, um, and I've and I've done this for since August by the grace of God. Now next year I only have seven, but then there's some other classes that have I think uh, fourteen, fifteen so this kids. This is a little bit of a bigger. Yeah. So and we're so you're seeing people want to move out there, want to move to these rural school districts, or even go to a school district. I think I have one kid that lives in Fort Collins. I have have two or three that live that come from Greeley or or a bigger school district. So it it causes space problems for us school smaller school districts when these kids come out from other districts or transfer from other districts. Does your guys' district have a mill levy override? We, we do. I think that's kind of the downside yeah. too, though, is is that if these kids are coming from other places, they may be paying a mill levy override. Mm-hmm. Say they're coming from Greeley Evans District 6. That's yeah. where they live, but their parents are commuting them out there. They are paying a mill levy override yep. to District 6, but that funds aren't going to the other no. schools where it's needed. And that's really concerning. You're going to need more and more paras, which you're losing paras daily as well. So you're losing teachers as well with the number of teachers that are exiting the profession and we're not getting them replaced as quickly as we need to. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, again, you know, and again, it's partly the legislation. There's, I mean, they keep throwing more and more at us. We're expected to be a psychologist as a teacher. We're expected to be a medical professional. Neither one of those I went to college to be. I do have a a question for you. Um, If a student of yours came to you and said, Mr. Hale, I believe that I am transgender. What would your response be? My response would be, well, who did God make you to be? I mean, and not only that, I have an obligation, a moral obligation to tell the parents, regardless of what the state laws say. I mean, I'll break the laws. I don't care. My God is, is, is first and foremost going to dictate how I respond to that kid. I would probably look at that kid and say, God made you into this from from birth. I understand your confusion. I understand what you're feeling. Probably ask them why they're feeling that way, why they're thinking that way. You know, is it, you know, is it something that happened 
during the course of them growing up? Is it being teased by other kids? Because a lot of times this is being, it's other kids teasing them, you know? I mean, telling them that they they look like a boy or a girl looks like a boy or a boy looks like a girl. Or, oh, you like you like baking or you like something feminine. You like sewing. Okay, so be it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That doesn't make that person into a different gender. And so I would probably have to come at it looking like that. Why is this child wanting to be something that they're not? I think that's a really great response because I think a lot of times, like you said, that there's something else leading to this to, to make them to feel this way, to, to lead to this. I talked about a couple of weeks ago, I talked about a child, a girl in District 6 who um, was sexually assaulted by her father. And for the last six years, she's been taking testosterone because she doesn't feel comfortable being a girl. Because of what her father did to her. So she sees this as the way to protect herself from ever being a victim again. And that's, we're not dealing with that underlying, we're not dealing with the underlying issues. We're not addressing those. We're putting a horrible bandaid on it. And you've got to address the underlying issues first. And and I'm going to be honest. I'd probably ask that child if I can pray with them. I mean, because I believe that they need to connect with God and they need to find who God made them to be yeah. because they're trying to figure out, they're trying to be what everybody, what the world wants them to be. They need to, they need to know that God loves them right where they're at. They need to know that God loves them for who they are. I just have to say, thank you so much, Corey, for being so strong in your faith in that yeah. aspect, because you don't know how many Christian teachers I come across that are willing to push their Christianity away for fear of being offensive. It's it's awful. And we need more more yeah. Christian teachers to be able to stand yeah. and say, mm. no, this is where I'm at and I will not compromise my values, no. my morals, just to make somebody else feel better about their sin. Yeah. I mean, that's I, at the end of the day, yeah. that's what it is, right? It that's is. why they're doing that is... And, and it, we're not saying call them sinners and, no. and throw tar and feathers on them. But we're saying that when you love them in truth, truth. you you tell them, them the truth. Yep, and you tell them the truth. And, and you've got to come from a place of love. And we're living in a time where the lines are being drawn. Yep. I mean, 100%. am I going to live for Christ and, and not care to lose my license? My, I, I don't care. I, if I may lose my teaching license. I may lose my job. But... My Christ, my faith, my God said he would provide for all of my needs, regardless of whether I have my job tomorrow, yeah. regardless of whether I have whether I have my teaching license. Yeah. If I have to lose my teaching license because, because of some of these laws, then I will lose my teaching license for some of these laws. I'm not going to look at a kid and tell them, that they are a different sex that they're not. Well, thank you so much, Corey, for joining us thank today. You. I think this was a really good conversation. Um, and thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys will join us next week.